Well, my guest on this, the ninth Lunch Club podcast, is Oscar award-winning producer David Parfit, who is behind, uh, I mean, just such a, a wealth of productions from Shakespeare in Love, famously to Much Ado About Nothing, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, The Madness of King George, Henry V, and most recently The Father, which I'm very excited uh, to talk to you about. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. It's lovely to have you, and I, I, I'd like to kick off by asking what, what is the most useful characteristic you can bring um, to, to a production, you specifically as a producer? Gosh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, almost something you'd have to ask directors, I suppose. Uh, I mean, I've always uh, thought of myself as a creative producer, so I really am involved uh, as early as possible in the process, and uh, I'm one of those people who are, are by camera every day. Um, you know, I like to be pretty much first on the set and last away. Um, so I think I, I sort of offer a, I hope, a level of support to directors that they find useful. Um, obviously allowing it to all run smoothly, which allows them to do their jobs better, um, but also just being on hand to consult um, and that goes all the way through the edit too. I think we were just chatting before I pressed the record button about um, you know life in general and the, the backdrop of our various experiences. I get that I've not met you before, but I get the impression you're a bit of an optimist. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, yep, very much so. That's that's been the case throughout the lockdown and uh, in all aspects of my life. Um, and in fact, my wife says, you know, we're we're. Um, we we sort of counter each other quite nicely in that she's very much the pessimist in the family, very much the one who brings reality to bear, um, and I, I I tend to be the one who is um, uh, yes uh, op an optimist uh, regardless of circumstance or fact. Indeed. Well, yeah, and speaking of fact, we live in an age where many things appear to be true all at once, and uh, and yet somehow not true at the same time, which is a, a neat link through to The Father, which deals beautifully with um, dementia. Anthony Hopkins, Olivia Colman, I've watched it, and I think it's fantastic. I'm not alone in saying that. It's had already, I know, a, a wonderful response, and I have got questions from the Lunch Club members uh, specifically about the production. But I, I'd like to just kick off with... Um, the way in which the film deals with dementia, because it, it's like nothing I've seen. And yeah, it holds many truths in the palm of its hand all at once. And I'm just wondering if you could just talk me through the development from stage to film. Um, it's one of those things, and you sort of said that I'm an optimist. I, I, I'm incredibly lucky. And um, this is one of those just great pieces of luck. I'd seen the play, um, not with the intention of, of uh, getting involved in the film at all. Um, and by coincidence, the producer of the play in London uh, is a chap called Simon Friend, uh, who was our general manager on our theatre productions. So we were working with him through the last three or four years. Um, and he had mentioned that they had uh, an intention to produce a film. Initially, I think they were, were, they were thinking of doing it in French, uh, as the original play was French. Um, but when they decided that they would rather do it in English, uh, he introduced me to the team who had developed it. So I only jumped in at the point that the script existed. Um, and it's just a very fine script. I mean, it's very close to the play. Um, which Christopher Hampton um, translated and adapted for the UK. Um, and then he and Florian together produced the screenplay. So it's got all, all, you know, all of the elements that made the play so excellent, um, but with you know, a little bit of a, a twist just to uh, mm. uh, make it appropriate for, for film. So that was just one of those really lucky coincidences that they, you know, they needed a UK producer and I was there um, to, to sort of help them bring it to the next stage. But you're right, I mean, the, the approach is, well, I mean, it's, it's unique. You are seeing dementia mm. from, from inside the head of the sufferer. It's, it, I mean, it is, although the point of view seemingly shifts, it's always Anthony, the lead character's yeah. point of view. And you see the world through his eyes, which is uh, funny, 
and dark mm. uh, and ultimately quite quite distressing. Um, the other thing that's been interesting for me is that my father-in-law is suffering from dementia um, and has been in the home for the last three years. So we can see all the parallels, you know, how the family deal with this. What, and now we feel we have a better understanding uh, of Philip, my father-in-law's situation, because how terrifying. You never know what's going to be there when you walk out of the door. It, it is, and it's it's something that I think the film manages to bring... It is There is heaviness, but there is, as you say, there is levity as well. Um, there's trouble all around from all of the characters, but I think what... I think what Anthony Hopkins manages to to bring quite uniquely, and I think he's he's exceptional at, is that sense of intimacy in his most lost moments. He just seems so so like a little boy, and it's 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 it it really does melt the heart uh, to see that. And I've got a question here actually from Gillian Williams, who wants to ask about casting Anthony Hopkins. Um, could you? I mean, it'd be great to, if you could talk us through how that came about. But also, she would like to ask: Do you prefer to go direct to agents and managers, or do you use a casting director? Um, well, the the direct question: Yes, we normally use a casting director. In this case, we didn't, um, and that was partly because uh, Florian Zeller, d- director and writer, um, had already made a direct approach. So. He looked at the film and thought uh, he couldn't think of anyone better to play the part. So he just went direct to the agent and said, will you read? And they did, and they liked it. So no one else was ever in consideration. The, the As you know, the characters called Anthony, uh, and it was aimed firmly at Tony Hopkins. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and luckily for us, he responded. Um, the rest of the casting was uh, a, a sort of more normal process. Um, but again, using uh, all of our connections through both theatre and film, um, it was all direct approaches. So this is something I think that's unique to you and, and trademark films is your your kind of cross pollination between the worlds of theatre, uh, history, and an extraordinary sort of sense of Britishness, which is just brilliant to see. Um, so. I, I, I guess where did I'd like to touch on where your interest in history comes from. I mean, was there a, a figure in your life, a, a really inspiring history teacher, that gave you the reverence for for it, or does it just did it just sort of fall out that way in your career that these things just were work that uh, that felt you felt you were flowing with? I think I think it's more more the latter. Um, uh, I, have, I have a very sort of uh, um, tenuous link <laughs> <laughs> um, in that uh, I saw to. I mean it. it it's, it's weird. I mean, I obviously had a normal education uh, up until I was 12, yeah. at which point I went to stage school where normal education stopped. I don't think it would be allowed now, but we didn't really do ordinary education. There, were, there was no maths teacher. There was no history teacher. Um, so, uh, And I left school at 16. So really, this has come about. I mean, I, I love history, and, uh, and I, I read quite a bit, um, and I love plays that uh, involve history and I love Shakespeare and all of those things have linked together but I mean I've been led into it in all sorts of different ways um, I mean my love of Shakespeare really comes uh, you know if you credit absolutely Kenneth Branagh um, and you know we partnered up he, he's my reason for moving into producing out of acting um, and he really introduced me properly to Shakespeare I mean, I'd had some involvement as an actor, but limited. Um, uh, but it was it was definitely Ken and his approach to Shakespeare that that, um, that made it a passion. So sp- just specifically making that jump from being an actor to a producer, uh, I mean, how, how did that happen, and, and how tough was that? Um, not not tough at all. Um, I mean, I'd been a child actor, so I'd I'd acted from twelve onwards um, but I think by the time I got into my late teens I was pretty sure that th- this was not what I wanted to do um, but again education comes into that there weren't that many options you know without any qualifications and without a degree um, to move into another field so I thought well whatever I do is going to have to be in the business 
um, and I started looking towards production. And it was just, again, luck that I, uh, I found myself in a production of Julian Mitchell's Another Country, the original production at Greenwich. Uh, this is in uh, 1981, I think. Uh, that transferred into the West End, and there were some cast changes going to the West End, one of which was Kenneth Branagh doing his first um, staged job out of RADA. We had next door dressing rooms, we uh, had six months in the West End, uh, and we had a lot of time to talk. Mm. Um, and a great part of those conversations was around the lack of control that actors have over their careers and whether the, it, it might be possible for us to change that and to perhaps have an actor-led theatre company. Not, again, not unique, but, um, but there weren't many around at that time. Um, and so we used, we used our time during, during the West End run to sort of, if you like, plan our escape. Yeah. Uh, and then Ken then went off and did, you know, he went to the RSC, he did some great work. And, but in the background, we were always talking about that through the early to mid 80s until we finally started our own company in 1987. And si um, it's, it's since throughout all that time, we were sort of we were practicing, as it were. Yes, the, it is the it is occupying the, the the headspace to then to deliver it and and things since then. I mean, I was going to ask actually, since trademark in 1999 kicked off, you know, the world has changed so much. But since the 80s, you know, just run us through. I mean, some of the biggest changes uh, that you've encountered as a producer. Well, I mean, it, it, it was it was sort of a massive. Well, obviously, the massive change was from actor to to producer, and I sort of realised that I was doing two jobs less well while I was mm. acting, playing fairly minor roles in our own company, but also trying to produce the shows and manage the tours and do all that background work. It was almost impossible to do both. So I I stepped back from acting pretty early on in in. Uh, what was Renaissance Theatre Company, which was the company I started with, Ken. Um, then through, you know, through that time, 87, 88, we were touring a lot, and um, we thought film might be a better way, in effect, of getting the plays to more people. Mm -hmm. So that's where Henry V came from, was the idea that we could, we could shoot uh, a production that had the same values as the theatre productions, um, but get it out to a much wider group of people. And that, that was our link into film. But of course, film, late 80s, it was a very tricky time for British film. There wasn't a lot happening independently. Um, the studios were in a terrible state. Um, but we sort of just marched in, not really knowing what we were doing. I love it. <laughs> um, and, you know, people say, you know, have you learned to be a producer? I have no idea how other people yeah. work. <laughs> Because we went straight from nothing to being producers. And yeah. You know, <laughs> found our way through it. So I sort of think, I've, I've always treated um, producing in film more like producing in theatre, really, but just on a bigger scale. Yeah, and actually that leads me to Steve Blackman's question um, from the Lunch Club membership. What are the challenges of using a play as source material when you're making a film? Um, it, in fact, in, in terms of the father... Uh, People who see both will, will understand it is very close. I mean, we do pretty much stay on one set, a set that changes, but it is pretty much on one set. Um, but I hope it, it doesn't really feel like a play. Um, you know, there are some things that you see transferred into film that, that really are just plays, shooting plays, as it were. Um, so wh what are the challenges? I mean, often it's a challenge of scale and, and opening things up. Um, Man as King George that obviously was a, a, a play before it was a film um, but Alan Bennett adapted his own play and obviously he was hugely experienced in film and it, it was just a question of op opening it up judicial cutting um, but essentially it was the same beast I think people who had seen the play would, would clearly recognise its origins uh, in the film yeah, and I think that's it's it's important, isn't it, to to maintain the sense of the, the work. I mean, there's no there's no point in taking it the idea and adapting it to the point where it's unrecognisable. Um, 
Lucy Daniel Raby wants to know what are the deciding factors when you're choosing a film project to work on? What's the what are the kind of priorities for you? I, I wish there were choices um, that, <laughs> that very often aren't. I mean, any anyone who knows about um, uh, producing in film and independent producing knows it is ridiculously difficult to get projects away. Mm. And you know, if I can say, even with the father, when we had um, Tony Hopkins and Olivia Coleman, we still had difficulty getting the finance. No way. There are still people going, well, it's a play. It's about dementia. It's about old people. You know, any of the things that you can think of, any reason you can think of to say no, it was really, really difficult. That's, um, that's, I'm really surprised by that because the subject matter, you know, dementia touches so many people. I mean, you've spoken about your father-in-law, Philip, and your personal experience, but it is something that, I think it's it's a it's something that many many people are aware of, but also from a point of view of exploring it in a dramatic sense. But no, I mean, uh, by the way, I, I should say that we did have amazing support in the end from Film Four, from Lionsgate, um, uh, who you know were our sort of solid anchor pieces of finance. But in the end, it was a private financier who really um, allowed the film to be made. Going, you know, going back to that idea of choice, we've, you know, at any given moment, probably got um, maybe three to six projects I at various stages of development. But I never know which ones are going to go. Um, you know, I've got projects that I, I, you know, I've had on the books for maybe five or six years that I can't get away, um, and other things just like the father come up from behind and you suddenly find yourself doing that instead of the stuff mm -hmm. you've developed in-house. Um, so I never know what's next. I've got no idea what I'm doing next year. Really? Not just because of COVID. Yes. Um, well, this also brings a question from Annie Irving and um, she wants to talk about co-productions and wants to know, will a no-deal Brexit make them infinitely more difficult to pull together, do you think? I think... Brexit just makes everything more difficult, mm, to be honest. Yeah. Um, um, it's the stupidest act of self-harm, I yeah. think. No, you know, cards on the table. I mean, I think at a time, you know, where all of us in the world should be uniting to, yeah. to be splitting off in this way, it's ridiculous. Yeah. However, you know, back to co-productions. Yep. Um, <laughs> I... So you are an optimist, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm looking at another co-production at the moment. Excellent. Um, so um, obviously things are going to be more difficult um, as we sort of uh, move into the Brexit process or beyond the Brexit process. In that, it's things like, you know, uh, if we have to move equipment, um, it'll all be carnade, work permits for everybody. Um, you know, a huge number of uh, people from mainland Europe work in film in London, for instance. All of those now have to have work permits. Um, it, um, there is a lot of paperwork anyway. They don't make them easy to do, even uh, under, under current rules. Um, so that can only get more complicated. However, you know, we're still going to continue to work with and in Europe regardless. Yeah, I think that's the right attitude. It's just plough on, isn't it? And um, make the best yeah. work that we possibly can. Is there, a, is there a kind of mantra in trademark films about how you work? Have you got a slogan emblazoned on the wall at your HQ? <laughs> no. Um, I, I had a, um, quite a big change of attitude um, almost, uh, well, probably seven or eight years ago now. Um, we did a film called My Week with Marilyn. Yeah. Um, which was uh, with Harvey Weinstein and the Weinstein Company. And uh, regardless of all the things that happened with Harvey later, it was a very difficult film. It was Harvey, I think, at his worst when he was on the edge of insane. Hmm. And he made, he made the whole process pr pretty bloody miserable. And I came out of that film saying, I'd rather do almost anything else than do that again. So we stopped working with the Weinstein Company at that point, and as they'd been our main financier, and many people's main financier, that was very difficult. So, uh, but the, the mantra was, just do things that you think you're gonna enjoy. Yeah. 
Um, so we went off and we made some documentaries about opera. Yes, I saw that with Glamborn and so forth. Yeah, yeah. which were great to do. Really, really the untold good fun story. To do. Yeah, mm. and um, uh, so we did yeah two documentaries with with, with Glamborn, um, and then uh, back into theatre with with the Wipers Times and yeah. some television. Yeah, and we we just these were things that were really great fun to do and very sort of creatively satisfying without the pain of dealing with a Harvey. And so that's been the change of attitude over the last sort of seven or eight years, um, is to really try to do things that look like they're going to be fun. And with that in mind, are you open to working, you know, across the board with any kind of digital pr provider? I mean, is there, are you specifically aiming for any, any outlets or any types of projects or are you just going to deploy the usual let's see yeah I mean it is a, it, there's always a degree of let's see I mean we have uh, a few things in development in television um, a, a six part limited series that's looking for a home um, we're, we're getting together on a big classic uh, novel hmm. with uh, another production company and we're developing uh, a comedy about opera Phenomenal. So, where's the opera link come from? Then, what's is that you? Um, it, it's it's fun, really. Again, it's just the stuff you know. I, I enjoy uh, performance of all sort, really, all sorts. But um, I've enjoyed opera a lot more over the last uh, decade or two. Um, and we were um, brought to a story about the reopening of the San Carlo in Naples mm. uh, in 1943. And the Allies reopened it uh, during the war. Um, so even though the people of Naples were in a terrible state and starving, uh, we thought it would be a really good idea to serve them some opera. Um, wow! Well, so, yeah. And uh, and, it, it, and it's just a lovely story. And Ian Hislop and Nick Newman, who we've worked with quite a lot, have, have written a very good script. Um, and so we're we're seeing if we can get that away. Well, that's a nice link into Nick Haig's question. Uh, he would love to know if you prefer working on historical drama or modern day. It's funny. Um, I haven't had as much opportunity to work on modern day stuff in that I think um, that if people think of me or trademark, um, it is in terms of doing sort of um, uh, period pieces. Um, it was a sort of in-house in joke that you know, if the, if there was a film with long frocks, it it would probably arrive on our desk at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we we don't we don't get involved in as many um, uh, contemporary stories as we might like. I mean, obviously there are fantastic stories out there, um, both historical and modern, um, but we just tend to find ourselves being led towards those period subjects. Mm. And Faye would love to know what your most challenging and or humorous moment has been, Faye Goodman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so difficult. I yeah. don't know, because it's all, you know, you, you come across these things on every project. I mean, uh, it's th there are always challenges. Um, you know, they can be mundane. Uh, you know, on on the father, it was about a, a you know a lighting rig that was too big for the studio power supplies, and having to bring in massive generators. Yeah, there are all of those sort of regular pr uh, problems that you have, and honestly, my memory is so bad I can't remember a funny uh, event. Isn't that terrible? No. I have them lined up as anecdotes. Yeah, <laughs> I think the, the, every every Apologies. no every project has its unique challenges. I think. You know, we're heading obviously into awards season, and um, inevitably, I'm sure the I'm sure the father will do well. I think for me though, the the, the, the highest praise I can really offer it is that I just I think it is a, a, an essay in empathy, and we need so much more of that at this particular time. Um, and I do hope it does well in the awards. I think it's great, uh, but I I just I'd love to know you know from your point of view because you know obviously you famously won the Oscar for Shakespeare in Love, what. Uh, but you have won so many other awards. I was scrolling through, looking, and it's 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 quite remarkable. One, There's another award just coming in. They're just about to tell you. <laughs> That's... Uh, um, turn that off. No, no don't worry. It's a, it's another richly deserved one. Um, but I, I I guess is there one that stands out? I mean, let's set aside the Oscar because because inevitably that's massive. But aside from the Oscar, which is the award that you're most proud of? That's a 
very interesting question. I, I think um, possibly the BAFTA for Madness of King George, I think that meant a lot to us. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we got nominated for quite a few things on that, didn't win a huge amount. Um, but I was really proud of our involvement with, with that. It was, a, um, it was a difficult film to get made. Um, you know, it, at the time it didn't have a big star in the lead. You know, Nigel Hawthorne was not a Hollywood name. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, I remember that when we, we, we worked with Samuel Goldwyn Jr. on that, who we'd worked with quite a bit, and there was great pressure to cast Tony Hopkins. Oh, fascinating, yeah. Um, uh, as they'd done with Shadowlands, in fact. Nigel Hawthorne originated it on stage, and Tony Hopkins did it for, for, for film brilliantly. Um, and we resisted that, and Nick Heitner and Alan Bennett, uh, Stephen Evans, who was my fellow producer on that, all of us re resisted the idea of Hollywood casting because we had this amazing cast uh, there already from, from the theatre with a couple of uh, other folk brought in. Um, and we held our nerve, and it paid off, and that was the award that sort of... Uh, made me believe it had paid off amazing well here's to many more and to, to your ongoing success and thank you so much for for joining me here on the lunch club podcast we'll have to have you in person to one of the lunches in 2021 that would be absolutely lovely it'd be nice to see anyone in person wouldn't it I know. i'll raise a glass to that <laughs> thanks david thank you very much <laughs>